This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and I will be talking about Euler's phi function or totient function. Um, so the first question is, what does totient mean? And the answer is totient doesn't really mean anything at all. It was just a, a name made up by Sylvester for Euler's totient function. Um, Sylvester has a sort of habit of making up large numbers of funny names for mathematical functions. So let's recall what phi of n is. So phi of n is the number of residue classes mod n that are co-prime to n. And let's just start by um, making a quick table of it just to get an idea of how it behaves. So let's take n to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Which shouldn't have 0. And let's list the residue classes that are co-prime to n. Well, for 1, there's only um, one residue class co-prime to 1, which is 0. For 2, we just get 1. For 3, we get 1, 2. 4, we get 1 and 3. 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, we get 1 and 5, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, we get 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 10, we get 1, 2, doesn't count, 3, 4, 5, 6, no, 7, um, yes, 8, no, 9, yes. So now we can work out what 5n is, it goes 1, um, uh, sorry, starts 1, 1, 2, 2, 4, 2, 6, 4, 6, 4. And you can see from this table that it's really a rather jumpy function. It sort of keeps bouncing up and down all the time. Um, there are some obvious um, things you can say about it. For example, if p is prime, then phi of p is obviously p minus 1. You can see this, so phi of 7 is 6, because all non-zero residue classes are co-prime to it. Um, so what we want to do is to calculate phi even when uh, phi of n for non-prime values of n. So let's see how we do this. The first key point is that phi of m n is equal to phi of m times phi of n. Well, you may be a bit suspicious of this, and if you look at my table, you see this is actually false. For instance, phi of 4 is not phi of 2 times phi of 2. That's because I, I missed out the condition that m and n are co-prime. Um, you remember, functions like this are called multiplicative. So, so multiplicative. So you, you might think multiplicative should mean this always holds, but it turns out to be more convenient to say it only holds when m and n are co-prime. And this follows from the Chinese remainder theorem that we just covered. Um, and the key point is that um, um, a pair AB um, with, if we've got a pair AB where A is mod M and B is mod N, then this corresponds, uh, then these correspond to numbers um, C modulo MN. Um, and um, we can see that C is co-prime to Mn if and only if A is co-prime to M and B is co-prime to, to, to N. So here, we remember, we're taking M and N to be co-prime. Um, so, you remember, so, so that follows because A is just C modulo M and B is C modulo N. So the number of things co-prime to mn, which is phi of mn, is now just the number of things co-prime to m, which is phi of m, times the number of things co-prime to n. So here we're using the Chinese remainder theorem to give a correspondence between residue classes modulo m and n to residue classes mod mn. And the Chinese remainder theorem only works when m and n are co-prime. So, so this formula doesn't usually hold if, if m and n are not co-prime. So um, now we can work out phi of n for any n. So suppose n is equal to p1 to the 
n1 times p2 to the n2 times p3 to the n3 and so on. So what is phi of n? Well, this will be phi of p1 to the n1 times phi of p2 to the n2 and so on. So this reduces to the case of prime powers. Well, prime powers are easy because phi of p to the m, um, we just want the numbers from 0 up to p to the m minus 1 that are co-prime to p to the m. Well, this just means not divisible by p. And the number that are divisible by p is obviously just p to the m minus 1 because um, because the, the, these are just p times um, anything up to p to the m minus 1. So the number that are not divisible by p to the m is just p to the m minus p to the m minus 1, which is equal to p to the m times 1 minus 1 over p. So um, this shows us what phi of n is. So phi of n is just um, p1 to the n1 minus 1 times p1 minus 1 times p2 to the n2 minus 1 times p2 minus 1 and so on, which you can write as being n times 1 minus 1 over p1 times 1 minus 1 over p2 and so on. So we have a, a nice formula for phi of n whenever we know the prime factorization of n. Um, I want to give a couple of other different ways of thinking about this formula. Um, so another way of calculating phi of n is by the inclusion um, exclusion principle. Um, and actually this is mainly a way of introducing the inclusion exclusion principle, which is um, a neat way of, of counting things. So let's first of all do phi of 6. Well, well, phi of 6 is going to be, um, well, you start with taking 6, and then you have to throw away the number of, of elements divisible by 2. So the number of elements divisible by 2 is 6 over 2. And then we have to throw away the number of elements divisible by 3, because these aren't co-prime to 6 either. So we subtract 6 over 3. But then we've thrown away too many, because we've thrown away the element 6 twice. So we have to add in the elements divided by 6. So, so 5, 6 ends up looking like this. And if you think about it, this is just 6 by 1 minus a half by 1 minus a third. Um, in fact, you, you can see this sort of by drawing a Venn diagram. So here are the residue classes divisible by 2. And we have three of them, 2, 4, and 6. And here are the residue classes divisible by 3. And here are the residue classes not divisible by, by, by anything. So we've, we've taken the all the residue classes one two three four five and six and then we've thrown out the ones divisible by two which correspond to those ones there and then we throw out the ones divisible by three which are these ones here and then we've thrown out the number six too much so we have to add it back in again so these things are added back in here um, and i'll just sort of um, do the case 30 to show you a slightly more complicated one. So suppose we look at by 30. So what we do is we write down all the residue classes up to 30. So we're going to have ones divisible by um, 2 or 3 or 5. Um, and so the ones divisible by 2, 3 and 5, we're just going to get 30 there. And the ones divisible by 2 and 3 are going to be multiples of 6. So we get 6, 12, 18, 24. And here we're going to get ones divisible by 3 and 5, which is 15 and 30. And here we get 2 and 5, so we get 10 and 20. And here we get the ones divisible by 5, which aren't divisible by 2 or 3. So we get 5, 10, um, 15, 20... 25, I guess. And here we get multiples of 3, not divisible by 2 or 5. And I'm getting a bit confused by this, so I'll probably get them wrong. So we get 3, um, 6, no, 9, yes, 12, no, 15, no, 18, no, 21, yes, and 27, um, yes. And here we get uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 
No, 14, yes. Uh, 16, 22, 26, 28, I think. And the ones left over are 1, 7, 11, um, 13, 17, 19, 23, and 29. So again, we see that phi of 30 um, is equal to 30, and then we subtract 30 over 2, which are these ones, then we subtract 30 over 3, which are these ones, then we subtract 30 over 5, which are these ones. Then we've thrown away these ones too much, so we have to add in 30 over 2 times 3, and then we have to add in 30 over 2 times 5 plus 30 over 3 times 5. And then we notice that these ones here, we, 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 we um, threw them away um, three times, but then we added them back in three times, and we should only have added it back in twice. So we have to subtract 30 over 30 um, to throw away this one again. Um, and the inclusion, in, inclusion exclusion principle works like this when you're counting things with very various properties. You have to first of all, so if you're trying to count the number of things without one of several properties, you first of all throw out the number with properties A and properties B and properties C, then you add in back the number which are property A and property B and so on, then you throw out the number with three of these properties, and if there were four properties we would then have to add back in the ones with four properties and so on. Um, and again if, if you look at this, the, this expression here can be written as 30 times 1 minus half times 1 minus a third times 1 minus a fifth, because if you multiply it out, you get all these factors. Um, there's an interpretation of this by probability. Um, so um, um, let's um, stick with the number 30 again and try and work out the number 30. We want to work out what is the chance that a number is co prime to 30, um, or the probability. Um, and this means uh, th th there are sort of three ways it could not be um, divisible by 30. Method A is it might be divisible by 2, and method B. Second problem is it might be divisible by three, or or C it might be divisible by five. And what's the probability that a number is divisible by two? Well, that's obviously a half. And the probability that's divisible by th three is is a third, and the probability it's divisible by five is one fifth. And the key point is these are independent events. Um, so in probability, two events are called independent if the probability that um, they both occur is equal to the probability that the first occurs times the probability that the second occurs. Um, so if we've got three events and we would want them to be, we would want any two of them to be independent, we'd have P, B and C would have to be P of B times P of C and P of A and C would be P of A times p of c. And you've got to be a bit careful here because that means any two of the events are independent, um, but it's possible um, that, that, that three of them are correlation. I'll, I'll give an example of this a bit later. So we also need to add the condition that the probability that all three events occur is probability of a times probability of b times probability of, of c. Um, anyway, um, so if we want to work out the probability that no events occur, so the probability that none of A, B and C occur, is just the probability that A or B or C, uh, sorry, it's just the prob, it's, it's, um, it, it's just given by 1 minus the probability that A occurs, minus the probability that B occurs, minus the probability that C occurs, plus the probability that A and B occur, and so on. And since A, B and C are independent events, this is just um, 1 minus the probability that A occurs, times 1 minus the probability that B occurs, times 
1 minus the probability that c occurs. So in our particular case, this is going to be 1 minus a half times 1 minus a third times 1 minus a fifth. So this is the probability that a number is co-prime to 30 in some sense. So the number of numbers less than 30 at the co-prime to 30 is going to be 30 times this, which is 30 times 1 minus a half times 1 minus a third times 1 minus a fifth, which you can figure is, is just 8. Um, so I mentioned that with probability arguments, you've got to be a little bit careful about independence. So I want to give an example where three events are pairwise independent, but but um, all three together are not independent. So so for this, I'm going to take, I'm going to suppose there are four events. Um, the events I'm going to call 0, 1, 2, and 3. So, and, and they might be equally probable. So you, so you might have a four-sided um, die. And to, to give an example of this, suppose, for example, you have been, say, kidnapped by an insane probability theorist. Um, who, who's going to, you know, you're, so you're in prison in your cell and he's going to throw this four-sided die and you have to um, um, guess whether the number he gets is even or odd. So um, if, if you manage to guess correctly, he will let you go and if you don't, he will shoot you. So the, 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 there's a big incentive to try and guess correctly. Well, so he rolls the four-sided die, and you have to guess. And you know, you know, you've, you've no idea. It, you you have, don't have any information about this. It could uh, the, there's a fifty-fifty chance that it's even, and a fifty-fifty chance that it's odd. So, so our first event is um, so event A is suppose the die is zero or two. Well, um, fortunately, you've got some help because there's a guy in a cell to the left of you, and he can sort of squint at the die and. He, he, he thinks um, the, the number is either 0 or 1 because, you know, maybe the number 0 and 1 are sort of written in red and he can sort of see the numbers reddish. So, so he tells you very helpfully that he's pretty sure the die is either 0 or 1. And does that help you? Uh, no, it doesn't. It, it gives you no useful information about the probability that the number is 0 because even if you know the number is 0 or 1, there's still a 50-50 chance that it's even. So, so the probability of A intersection B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. So the probability of A is a half, and the probability of B is a half, and the probability that A and B both occur is a quarter. So, so that means these two events are independent, and knowing B isn't helpful if you're trying to figure out A. Well, OK, well, there's a guy in the cell on the other side of you, and they're pretty sure that the number is either 0 or 3 for some weird reason. And, you know, does knowing that help at all? Well, no, again, the probability of A intersection C is the probability of A times the probability of C. So, so just as, you know, the, guy, the information of the guy on the left wasn't any use because these events are independent and same the, the information of the guy on the right doesn't seem to be any use because you know it's just you just changed one to three however if if you combine the information from these guys to the left and the right of you so one says it's zero or one and the other says it's zero or three now now suddenly you know what the result is you know it must be zero and you notice the probability of a intersection b intersection c is not equal to the probability of a times the probability of B, times the probability of C. So, so what we have here are three events, and you can check that any two of these events are actually independent events, but all three of them become dependent. So um, when you're you know, doing these arguments of probability, you have to be very careful um, about these sorts of slightly paradoxical um, things. In fact, probability is full of weird, unintuitive paradoxes, and Basically, unless you've been trained in a probability course, you should be extremely wary about all arguments using probability. Um, so anyway, so we've now got a formula for phi of n. Um, let's just try out an example. So let's try and work out what, uh, what what is phi of 10 factorial. Well, all we have to do is to work out the prime factorization of 10 factorial. So this is 2 times 3 times 4, which is 2 squared, times 5, times 6, which is 2 times 3, times 7, times
times 8, which is 2 cubed, times 9, which is 3 squared, times 10, which is 2 times 5. So we multiply this up. This is equal to 2 to the power of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. If, if I get this wrong, um, it's, it's, of course, a deliberate error to see if anyone's paying attention. Then we get 3 to the power of 1, 2, 3, 4. Then we get 5 to the power of 2, and we get 7 to the power of 1. So phi of this would be 2 to the 7 times 2 minus 1, 3 cubed times 3 minus 1 times 5 to the 1 times 5 minus 1 times 7 to the 0 times 7 minus 1. And I'm, I'm not going to bother to work this out because it's not terribly exciting. So working out phi is very easy if you know the prime factorization. Um, so let's do a, 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 a couple of um, slightly less trivial examples. Let's find all numbers um, n with 5n equals 24. So let's think about this. Well, obviously, the first thing you do is you look at the prime factorization of 24, which is 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. And this has to be phi of n. Well, n is going to be um, a product of things of the form p to the a, and p to the a is going to give you p to the a minus 1 times p minus 1. So um, all of these things um, will have to sort of combine into things like p to the a minus 1 and p minus 1. And you notice, in particular, p minus 1 must be a factor of 24. So what are the factors of 24? We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 12, 24. So um, one of the, the, these must be p minus 1. So the possible choices of p are 2, uh, 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 two or 3. Well, 4 isn't a prime, so that's no good. Or 5, here we get 7. 9 isn't a prime, so we get 13. So the possible primes are these. Um, and you notice we can't get 5 squared because that would mean we would have to have a factor of 5 here. And we can't get 7 squared and we can't get 13 squared. But we could perhaps get 3 squared. So, And, and we could get 2 to the power of... Um, well, you imagine we could get up maybe up to 2 to the 4. So, so the number n is going to be 2 to the 0, 1, 2, 3 or 4 times 3 to the... Um, 0, 1, or possibly 2 times 5 to the 0 or 1 times 7 to the 0 or 1 times 13 to the 0 or 1. So it's going to be one of these numbers here. And of course, it can't be all of them because, you know, if you've got if you've got um, 13 to the power of 1, then that's going to use up a couple of 2s and a 3 that you can't use for anything else. So so the numbers are quite restrictive. Um, and in fact, if you if you go through it systematically, um, you find you could get the numbers of 13 times um, 2 squared. So if you have a 13, then that uses up um, 2 of the 2s and 1 of the 3. So we've just got a 2 left over. And we can, we can get a single 2 by having a 13 times 2 squared or a 13 times um, 3. Or we could even get a 13 times a 3 times a 2 because we can, you know, you can sort of add an extra 2 to an odd number without increasing without increasing phi. So that's all the ways you can get using 13. Then we go through all the ways using 7, and we get 7. Well, we could have, a, um, if we've got a 7, we used up a 2 and a 3. So we've got to somehow use up two more 2s. And we can do that by having a 2 cubed, or a 5, or a 5 and a 2, or a um, 2 squared and a 3. And I think that's that's about all the ways I can think of using up 7. Um, um, or we could have a 5, and if we have a 5, that uses up two twos. So we've now got to get rid of a 3 and a 2. And we can get it by having 5 times 3 squared, or 5 times 3 squared times 2. Um, and um, I can't think of any other ways of using up the, the 2 and the 3. So, so that's all, all the ways with the 13 and a 7 and a 5. And now we've got to go through all the ways of doing it with um, um, some twos and threes. Well, we need a we need a three squared to account for the three, and that uses up a two, and then we have um, to account for two twos left over, and that we can do with a two cubed. So we get one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten ways of doing this. Um, by the way, um, there, there, there's a problem called the Carmichael conjecture, um, which says, um, given um, n, can we find m not equal to n with 5m equals 5n? Um, and as far as we know, the answer is always yes. And people have done sort of searches and it's known that any n without this property must have at least 10 billion digits. I, I don't mean that n is at least 10 billion. I mean n has at least 10 billion digits in it. So it's at least 10 to the power of 10 billion. So, so counterexamples must be unbelievably huge. And to see what the problem is, you notice that suppose n is odd, then 5n must be equal to 5 2n. So, so for any odd number, there's another number um, with, the, with the same value of phi. And similarly, if n is 2 modulo 4, then you can divide it by 2 and find something with another number. So n must be divisible by 4. And um, by using um, lots of other similar arguments to this, you can easily check that n must be divisible by lots and lots of other primes. And you can get so many primes dividing n that n has to be unbelievably huge but no one's ever managed to manage to actually prove that you can't find such an n um carl michael thought he had proved it but then he noticed an error in this proof so it turned into a conjecture um so an another similar example is can we find numbers with phi n power of two um this is of some historical interest um, because Gauss showed that we can construct a regular n-gon um, with ruler and compass um, if and only if phi of n is a power of 2. Um, I mean, constructing a regular n-gon with ruler and compass is, of course, rather pointless. Um, but it's, it, was a, it was a sort of old problem, old geometrical problem. So um, we want phi of n to be 2 to the k. And let's suppose n is equal to um, a product of primes p1 to the n1, p2 to the n2, and so on. So phi of n is going to be p1 to the n1 minus 1 times p1 minus 1, and, and so on. And we notice from this that if pi is not equal to 2, then ni must be equal to 1, because otherwise the number 5n would be divisible by pi. Um, we also notice that pi minus 1 is a power of 2. So it must be a Fermat prime. So we see that n is a power of 2, times um, p1, times p2, and so on, where these are distinct Fermat primes. You remember, Fermat prime is one that's one that's such that p minus 1 is a power of 2. And conversely, if n is of this form, you can immediately see that 5n is a power of 2. So that the numbers that can be constructed by ruler and compass are exactly of the form 2 to the um, 2 to the n times a subset of the Fermat primes, which are 3, 5, um, 17, 257, 6, 5, 5, 3, 7. So the first few of these are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, um, 10, 15, 16, and so on. Um, so the Greeks knew how to construct um, polygons with these number of sides. Um, the first new one was found by Gauss, who noticed um, that you could construct a 17-sided polygon by ruler and compass. And he was a teenager when he discovered that. Um, so we can also ask, how big is pi of n? Or how small is it? Well, an obvious upper, the upper bound is pretty obvious. So 5n 
is certainly less than n, at least when n is not equal to 1, which is a kind of trivial case. And phi of p is p minus 1 for p prime. So, um, so we can look at phi of n over n, and we know this is less than or equal to 1, and it gets very close to 1. Um, because whenever n is prime, it can be sort of as close as you like to 1. Um, so, conversely, we can ask how small can phi of n over n get? Well, phi of n over n is equal to 1 minus 1 over p1 times 1 minus 1 over p2 and so on, where the pi are the primes dividing n. So obviously for phi of n to be small compared to n, we want um, n to be divisible by lots of small primes. And th th this makes it obvious how to find numbers with phi of n quite small. We can take 2, where phi of n over n is, is a half. Or we can take 2 times 3, where phi of n over n is now 1 over 2 times um, a half times 2 thirds, which is um, a third. Uh, the next one is 2 times 3 times 5, which is 30. And here we get 8 over 30. And 2 times 3 times 5 times 7, which is 210. Um, and so, so the numbers with phi of n being unusually small are just the product of the first few primes. So we can ask, can we make this number as small as we like? Could we make it less than, say, 1 over 100? Well, in, in order to answer this, we need to know how small can um, the number 1 minus a half times 1 minus a third times 1 minus a fifth times 1 minus a seventh and so on get. Um, so you can imagine two things happening. One, it could just get smaller and smaller and smaller and and, and get as close as you'd like to zero, or there might be some lower limit to it, which is correct. Well, we can figure this out by looking at its inverse, one over one minus a half, times one over one minus a third, one over one minus a fifth, and so on. And if we multiply this out, well, this is equal to one plus a half plus one over two squared plus one over two cubed, and so on, times one plus a third plus one over three squared, and so on all the way up to times 1 plus 1 over p plus 1 over p squared and so on. And this is going to be some sort of big sum of 1 over various integers. And you see that, 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 that this is going to be a sum over all n such that all prime factors of n are less than or equal to p. Um, because every time you, you multiply these numbers together, you have to pick one number from this one and one from this one and one from this one. So you'll get one over one over n, where n is some power of two times some power of three and so on. Um, so this is going to be at least sum of sum over n um, less than or equal to p of one over n. So... Um, now we remember from calculus that the series 1 plus a half plus a third plus a quarter and so on tends to infinity. Um, we recall you can see this very easily because this is greater than or equal to a half plus a half and the next four terms are all at least a quarter. Sorry, um, that's not right. That's not bigger than a half. This is... Um, sorry... Uh, Put these the wrong way around. Um, these two are bigger than a quarter, and the next four are all bigger than an eighth. So there should be two terms that are bigger than a quarter. So the sum is going to be at least a half plus a half plus a half uh, plus a half, and so on. And since this goes on forever, you can make the series as big as you like. So the conclusion is the product over all primes of 1 minus 1 over p actually tends to 0. Um, in fact, it becomes 0 if, uh, uh, if you take all primes here. So the conclusion is that phi n over n can be as small as you like, provided... Um, 
but, but, but bigger than zero. So you can make it less than, say, one over a million, if you like. Um, however, um, in order to make it less than a million, you'd need n to be really extraordinarily large, because although this product tends to zero, it doesn't tend to zero all that fast. And you need to take a very, very large number of primes in order to make this small. Um, um, we can ask a similar question, you know, what is the average value of 5n over n? So we've seen we can make it as close to zero as we like, and it's obviously as close to one as we like. Does it have a sort of average value? And you, you can think of this as being um, the chance that a number is co-prime to n very roughly speaking. Well, this will obviously vary a lot depending on whether, you know, it will be close to one if n is prime and not otherwise. And we want to sort of average this over all n. So we can ask the following question. What is the chance that two numbers, m and n, chosen at random, are co-prime? Well, the first problem is that you can't choose two integers at random. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so, you know, this, this phrase chosen at random is extremely dubious. Um, you know, if, if you want to choose numbers at random with every integer being equally likely, you have to, you know, say that the, the chance of each integer must be um, some number epsilon, and you want epsilon to be the same for all integers, well, the sum of all the epsilons has to be 1, so epsilon has to be 0. So the chance of any integer being chosen is 0, and it doesn't make sense to choose integers at random. Um, so whenever you see the phrase choose an integer at random, you want to be a little bit nervous. Um, but you can sort of make sense of this. Suppose you choose m and n to be chosen at random from the integers less than or equal to some big number capital N. Um, this makes more sense, although the answer may, of course, depend on capital N. Well, let's see if we can answer this. Um, we want them to be co-prime. Um, what's the chance that they're not both divisible by 2? Well, this will be 1 minus a quarter, because there's a 1 in 4 chance that they're both divisible by 2. What's the chance they're not both divisible by 3? Well, this will be 1 minus... 1 over 3 squared, because there's a 1 in a 9 chance that, that, that they're both divisible by 3. And similarly, the chance they're not both divisible by 5 is 1 minus 1 over 5 squared, and so on. So what we really want is that the chance that they're co-prime is going to be the chance they're not divisible by any, by, any, um, by any prime. So we multiply these all together, and we find that the, the, the probability that m and n are co-prime is going to be about 1 minus 1 over 2 squared times 1 minus 1 over 3 squared times 1 minus 1 over 5 squared and so on, where this is a product over all primes. Um, OK, I've, I've done a certain amount of fudging here because um, I said we're going to take m and n less than or equal to some big number, capital N. And obviously, if we fix capital N, the chance isn't going to be exactly that, because first of all, we should cut off at primes bigger than capital N. And secondly, the chance is not going to be exactly 1, 1 minus 1 over 3 squared unless 3 divides N and so on. So um, there's some fudging going on, but we will just ignore that. Um, and now we want to know what happens to this product. Does it tend to zero or does it tend to some limit? So you remember formerly we saw that 1 over 1 minus 2 times 1 minus 1 over 3 and so on tends to zero. So you might think the same happens for this. But in fact, it doesn't. Um, if we work out this sum here, we can take its inverse just as before and we get 1 plus 1, 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 2 to the 4 and so on. And then we multiply it by 1 plus 1 over 3 squared plus 1 over 3 to the 4 and so on. Do the same for all other primes. And now we multiply together all these expressions and we get the sum over all integers n of 1 over n squared because every integer n can be written as a product of 
a power of two and a power of three and a power of five and so on. So if you multiply together all these infinite sums, you get this sum here. And the sum of one over n squared is actually convergent. Um, you can see it's convergent by, say, using the integral test because you know the integral of 1 over x squared from 1 to infinity dx is finite. And Euler rather incredibly managed to evaluate this sum and found it's equal to 6 pi squared over 6. Um, I'm not going to uh, um, show that it's pi squared over 6, at least not in this lecture, because that, that involves a certain amount of analysis. So that's the inverse of this product here. So, so this product here is actually 6 over pi squared. So the chance that two numbers are co-prime is actually 6 over pi squared, which is absolutely bizarre. I mean, the, 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 you seem to have a problem about, you know, straightforward problem in number theory what is the chance that two numbers are co-prime and all of a sudden the number of pi is is popping up out of nowhere um so just have a final slide on pi what is what does this generating function look like well generating function means you form a power series sum of x to the n times phi n so you can think of this as being a function and it actually converges for x having absolute value less than one. So what properties does this function have? Well, I have no idea. I mean, it's an absolutely ghastly function. Um, phi jumps up and down and this is very difficult to control. So the generating function like this is not terribly useful. However, there's another way of forming a generating function which is very much better where we form sum over phi n over n to the s. Um, so this is phi of 1 over 1 to the s plus phi of 2 over 2 to the s and so on. And there's a much nice, th 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 there's a very simple expression for this. This turns out to be zeta of s minus 1 over zeta of s, where you recall zeta is the Riemann zeta function. Zeta of s equals 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 2 to the s and so on. Um, and um, um, we can see this by um, just uh, recall we had Euler's product for zeta of s so this is equal to 1 over 1 minus 2 to the minus s times 1 over 1 minus 3 to the minus s times 1 over 1 minus 5 to the minus s and so on. Um, you notice, by the way, we actually used this Euler product twice already this lecture for s equals um, for s equals 1 and s equals 2. Um, well, this means that zeta of s minus 1 is um, equal to the product of 1 over 1 minus 2 to the Sorry, 1, 1 over 1 minus p to 1 minus s, where we're taking product over all primes. So, um, um, zeta of s minus 1 over zeta of s just becomes a product over all primes of expressions like this. 1 plus p minus 1 over p to the s plus um, p times p minus 1 over p to the 2s and so on. And now you notice that this thing is phi of p and this thing is phi of p squared and so on. Um, and now we use the fact that phi of m n is phi of m times phi of n whenever n, whenever m and n are co-prime in order to see that this is just equal to the product of sum over all n of phi of n over n to the s. Um, so Euler's phi function has a nice generating function, but you need to use these um, Dirichlet series rather than power series in order to get a nice expression for it. Um, for later use, we will be using the following um, formula, which I think is due to Gauss or possibly Euler, um, which says that sum over d divides n phi of d is equal to n. It's slightly surprising when you first see it. Um, in order to understand why this is true, let's just take a look at the case n equals 12. So I'm going to write out the residue classes modulo 12. So we have 12 residue classes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 
And now I'm going to divide them up um, according to um, the what what is the greatest common divisor of a and 12 so a 12 could be it could be 1 2 3 4 6 12 so let's see how this works well the ones with highest common divisor 1 are 1 5 7 and uh why did i stop at 10 there and um 11 ones with highest common divisor 2 are um two and ten highest common divisor three we get three and nine highest common divisor four we get um four and eight and highest common divisor six we get six and highest common divisor twelve we get twelve so here i've divided up these twelve numbers into um six classes according to their highest common divisor and now we we count how many there are well here there are going to be five of 12 of them here there are five of six here there are five of um four here there are five of three five of two and five of one so um what we notice is that the number of residue classes um with a 12 equals d is just phi of 12 over d and the reason for that is that um, the residue classes with highest common divisor d are just the residue classes co prime to 12 over d multiplied by d for instance you see these residue classes here are three times one and three times three and one and three are the numbers co prime to 12 and here we get the numbers 2 times 1 and 2 times 5 and 1 and 5 are the numbers co prime to 6 and exactly the same works for any number n um, so phi of n over d is the number of residue classes um, um, a mod n with a n equals d and that's because these residue classes are just d times a1 d times a2 and so on um, where a1 a2 are the numbers less than or equal to n over d that are co prime to n over d so the number of these is just phi n over d so the total number of residue classes mod n and the number of residue classes mod n is of course just n is just equal to sum over all numbers d dividing n of phi of n over d and this is just the same as the sum d divides n of phi of d because you can just change d to n over d as, as d runs through the divisors of n n over d also runs through the divisors of n um, incidentally this formula um, that um, the sum of the divisors the sum over the divisors of 5d is equal to n actually determines the function phi by by induction because you can see you can now write phi of n is equal to n minus the sum over d divides n where d is less than n of phi of d so phi is the only function that satisfies this formula here so we'll later be using this formula when we discuss primitive roots so don't forget it okay that's all about euler's totient function